Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm Peter Bergen. I run the National Security Program here. <clears throat> it's with a lot of pleasure that um, uh, we get to welcome Mike Allen uh, to talk about his excellent new book, Blinking Red. Um, and uh, Mike has had a distinguished career, most recently uh, in, in, the, in the government uh, as uh, Chief of Staff to Mike Rogers on the House Intelligence Committee. He also spent seven years in various senior positions at the National Security Council and under in the George W. Bush administration. Uh, he managed to write a book and have two young sons and set up a very successful new business, Beacon Strategies, uh, all in the space and continuing working on the, on the, on the Hill at the same time. Um, so very impressive, all those uh, different things to do those simultaneously. Uh, Mike has agreed to speak about the big themes and stories in his book for about half an hour, and I'll engage him in Q&A and then throw it open to your questions. Mike. Very good, thank you. I think I'll go okay. to the podium Great. if that's okay. <coughs> I think you can do without that. Yeah, see. <laughs> I wanna thank the New America Foundation for having me today, especially Peter for um, the invitation, and thank you all for coming out in the rain to uh, hear a little bit about, about my book, Blinking red, and I look forward to Q&A about other pressing intelligence community topics. Um, Blinking red is an attempt to write the authoritative, objective history of the most substantial restructuring of the U.S. intelligence community since its foundations in 1947. The aim in 1947, of course, was to create a central intelligence agency that would, and this sounds familiar to many of you who've studied 9-11, but to make sure that pockets of the U.S. government did not have information that, if shared with other entities of the government, might foretell of a particular attack or national security threat on the United States. Um, the National Security Act, of course, also created the National Security Council and the Defense Department. Um, but the creation of the Central Intelligence Agency really laid the foundations for the modern American intelligence community. Um, the fault of the National Security Act of 1947 was that it seemed to give the Central Intelligence Agency many responsibilities for coordinating the variety of intelligence entities across the federal government, but not enough authority to do the job. So let me break that down for you, just if I could. Um, the CIA is, of course, famous for two missions you're all very familiar with, covert action and the recruitment of spies around the world. The Security Act of 47 also sought to make the CIA director give him another mission, which was to manage the community, to be the DCI, and to coordinate the growing infrastructure of intelligence agencies that had begun to grow up around World War II. Um, af as you approach through the Cold War years, a variety of task forces and commissions noted that the underlying ability of the Director of Central Intelligence to coordinate, for example, the SIGINT, the Signals Intelligence Entities in the Department of Defense, was very weak. Literally dozens of commissions and foundations recommended augmenting the Director of Central Intelligence's power so that they would be able to keep up with the increasing complexity, billions of dollars being spent in American intelligence, and to be able to better face down the Soviet Union. None of these recommendations, none of these attempts to reform or centralize greater authority in a Director of Central Intelligence went anywhere until 2004. There were several factors, which I go through in blinking red, that contributed to this major juggernaut of activity, which rewrote one of the most famous pieces of legislation in American history in four and a half months. There were a variety of things going on that summer. I want to take you back a little bit. I think you'll remember these very well. Um, at the time, the Central Intelligence Agency had really taken a beating. They had been through grueling hearings before Congress about who should be blamed for 9-11 and whether the CIA had failed to watch list 
certain individuals and had otherwise failed to share information with the FBI that might have foretold of or allowed the FBI to investigate the plots on 9-11. Um, the CIA, I think it's fair to say, was really buffeted by um, these particular hearings and then the 9-11 Commission came along and had another set of hearings which really were very very tough indeed the chairman of the 9-11 Commission noted that their staff statement about what happened what the CIA did on 9-11 was really an indictment of the agency's performance um, a second factor that occurred that contributed to this momentous change of events in the fall of 2004 um, was really the 9-11 Commission itself. They were a group of nationally prominent men and women who were able to build a national audience through a series of hearings about what had happened on 9-11 and really they had a lot of cachet and a lot of influence and indeed they constructed their own strategy to be able to build a legislative proposal that would have a chance of succeeding and could be acted on very swiftly. Um, the third factor occurring at the time was that the failure or the misassessment of Iraq WMD was coming into stark relief in the summer of 2004. The Senate Intelligence Committee's report came out and faulted groupthink and again the CIA was at a very low level of prestige at the time. Um, and finally I, you have to note of course the presence of the 9-11 Commission families who I go through in the book became quite a powerful special interest group advocating for reform of the intelligence community joined forces with the 9-11 Commission and was able to have tremendous influence over the process. The last thing and really the conventional wisdom is is that we created a director of national intelligence and a national counterterrorism center that the 9-11 Commission recommended because of the presidential election of 2004 um, I think the conventional wisdom is a little bit wrong for the reasons I just stated. I think that the looming presidential election in which the performance of George Bush and whether he had made the country safer were undoubted, undoubtedly incredibly powerful factors that influenced the likelihood of Congress and the President to take on intelligence reform. Um, but it's not the only factor there was exhaustion with the CIA and we had not one but two spectacular intelligence failures really in the same two to three year period. Um, so what did the 9-11 Commission recommend? What they recommended was a director of national intelligence, really a super empowered spy master who would have the ability to in an increasingly complex world of proliferators and stateless international terrorists be able to in the 9-11 Commission's words have a court we needed a quarterback we needed someone very agile who would be able to move dollars people and analysts to be able to meet new threats to be able to organize quickly to meet what they determined was perhaps a more greater intelligence or national security challenge than the Soviet Union had been in the 9-11 Commission's estimation the Soviet, Com Soviet Union while foreboding of course at least in an intelligence sense, there were embassies from which to recruit spies, there were armaments to look at through satellites and other particular government agencies to seek to intercept their communications, but that this wasn't the case with terrorist cells and so we needed to be able to organize differently. Um, on the point about there being a particular electoral impact, um, John Kerry, the Democratic nominee for president, endorsed the 9-11 Commission recommendations 17 minutes after the Commission recommendations were announced in July 2004. George Bush endorsed the DNI in concept 10 days later. So this speaks to the tremendous force and the, the incredible forces that were at play at this particular time. Um, however, while a lot of members of Congress and the two leading individuals of each political party endorsed the 9-11 Commission's recommendations nearly immediately, it inspired tremendous bureaucratic opposition and this is really the heart of Blinking Red. It is a tale of bureaucratic power and jockeying for influence really over the 80 billion dollar intelligence enterprise who would be able to control the intelligence assets of the United States. 
Um, I go through the book three camps that were in opposition to the 9-11 Commission's recommendations. I'll go through them briefly and then we'll talk a little bit about what the entire act means for national security today. But I think these three camps are very important because as people try and contemplate um, where we are 10 years after the 9-11 Commission report, a lot of people are asking, well, how is the system working and how could we improve it? Why did we create it and what were we trying to do at the time? Um, one of the camps that broke out immediately in opposition to the 9-11 Commission report were those in the military who argued that the primary mission of intelligence should be direct tactical support to the warfighter and that now in this time period in 2004 was no time to centralize intelligence anywhere, or anywhere else be it into the current system with the director of central intelligence located at Langley, Virginia, a DCI who in their estimation might retain the two other missions that the DCI had, namely human intelligence and covert action, but especially not into a new super empowered individual, a spy master, because they viewed this as a zero sum game that any rebalancing of authority away from the Department of Defense would degrade the Department of Defense's intelligence capabilities. The two principal players in this camp were Secretary Rumsfeld and Vice President Cheney. Um, Secretary Rumsfeld is, of course, uh, very quotable. Um, he, at the time, was vociferously against the 9-11 Commission recommendations. And he wrote in a letter to George Bush from this time period something um, that I think is very notable and you can almost hear some of the intensity in his voice, which was something basically that the United States Congress, the media, and John Kerry can afford to be wrong and pay no penalty. The President of the United States has to be right on a matter of such importance. And he ended this memorandum to George Bush at the time, which is detailed in the book, with a single word, caution, urging caution on the president before he adopted these particular recommendations. Vice President Cheney, himself a former Secretary of Defense, also opposed the DNI recommendations. He focused on the fact that we were at war at the time in Iraq and Afghanistan and said now was no time to be rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic as we were trying to fight and win a war. Um, the second view was those at CIA. CIA, I think, took some offense that they were being so heavily faulted for intelligence failures on 9-11 and began to um, argue that really what the essence of power is in Washington, D.C. is bureaucratic clout and that at least the director of central intelligence, the, the head of the intelligence community, when he headed the CIA, at least had troops. He had analysts. He had collectors. He had someone that he could ask, and they would actually respond to what he wanted to do. So the point of Robert Gates, himself a former DCI, and he argued that summer that the 9-11 Commission's DNI would would create essentially a eunuch, someone who would be unable to effectuate his will. Indeed, this was the view of almost all, all but one of the former directors of Central Intelligence who argued that the only way to increase centralized power in the intelligence community would be to give him more authority and more bureaucracies to directly control and not to subtract from his authority by separating these community management functions, these coordinating functions from the CIA, from Langley, Virginia. Um, finally, another camp, and this is interesting because of who the two people were and the positions that they would come to hold. They argued, without the knowledge of Secretary Rumsfeld, ironically enough, that the National Security Agency and the National Geospatial Agency, at the very least, these two factories of intelligence, now we know NSA very well through the constant revelations in the newspaper, they argued that the um, DNI would be indeed feckless unless they had authority, direction, and control 
over these massive intelligence agencies that resided in the Department of Defense. The two individuals who argued for this bureaucratic position are the current Director of National Intelligence today, Jim Clapper, and the future CIA Director, General Michael Hayden. At the time, they were the head of NGA and NSA, respectively, so it was quite an incredible position that they would advocate of actually moving their bureaucracies out of the Department of Defense. This set up, of course, the infamous lunch in Washington when Secretary Rumsfeld learned of General Hayden and General Clapper's efforts to advocate around town on behalf of a more muscular DNI, a DNI who would control their intelligence agencies. And Rumsfeld invited them to lunch at the Pentagon. And to hear General Hayden retell the story, he says it looked like peace talks between North and South Korea as they sat on opposite sides of the table. And the only thing missing were the respective flags of their nation. Um, they sat there and argued about whether the DNI and the 9-11 Commission recommendations would lead to a more successful intelligence community. And according to the participants of the lunch, Secretary Rumsfeld slammed his fork into his plate and said he couldn't believe what he was hearing from two people who had worn the uniform of their country that the DNI should not have control or any additional control over the intelligence agencies in the Department of Defense. And needless to say, the lunch ended badly and the rest is history. Um, these bureaucratic divisions, and the book goes through this, were reflected and argued aggressively throughout August 2004 in the National Security Council as George Bush's advisors tried to color in exactly what President Bush's beliefs would be in a piece of legislation that he later sent to the Hill on what the future intelligence communities would look like. I won't go into this in great detail, but the Congress embraced the 9-11 Commission recommendations, the DNI and the NCTC, the DNI separate from the CIA, and really tried to, in the United States Senate, enact the will exactly of the 9-11 Commission's report. I was there at the time as a White House Legislative Affairs staffer, and people carried around the 9-11 Commission book as if it were the Bible, and tried to interpret as faithfully as possible what they thought the 9-11 Commission meant. And this is really the reason for my argument of why the 9-11 Commission has really been the most successful commission in American history, because they were able to dictate the policy agenda in the fall of 2004, cause the Congress to immediately endorse and the respective presidential nominees to nearly immediately endorse their recommendations. Um, the bill did hit some snags. The House of Representatives um, was more interested in the Secretary of Defense's authority over the intelligence agencies, and the book goes exhaustively through some of the arguments that they advanced in opposition to the 9-11 Commission, and eventually how after the presidential election of 2004, the bill was enacted into law. Um, I'll end with this. Um, Secretary Gates uh, was gracious enough to let me interview him for my book, and I wanted to know his views and whether it was true, whether the rumor was true that President Bush had offered him the job to be the first director of national intelligence. Um, he confirmed that indeed Andy Card and Steve Hadley, the, two of the president's top lieutenants, had tried to recruit him to be the director of national intelligence. And I think this is very sort of an interesting contemporaneous view of the statute immediately after it passed and indeed was really looked down the road to some of the problems that the DNI would have in his first years. Um, he gave me his emails that he sent to the White House in December and January of 2004-2005, critiquing the law and trying to lay out some of the conditions that he would ask President Bush for, for him to even consider it. Um, Secretary Gates, and I have this in the book, described the new law as, quote, strange. He said, the president needs to make clear that the new director of national intelligence is the head of the intelligence community, not some mere budgeteer or coordinator um, who just has 
common denominator, the ability to convene people and only hash out the common denominator about the policies and directives affecting the U.S. intelligence community. Um, eventually, Secretary Gates turned down the offer. He said sort of funnily to me that um, Hadley and Card made a mistake that a neophyte car salesman would never make when I visited the White House. They let me off the lot without a sale. He went back to Texas. He thought about whether to take the job and eventually turned it down. Um, we had four DNIs in the first five years. It inspired bureaucratic opposition from the Central Intelligence Agency, which as I mentioned wasn't in a very good place to be able to affect the outcome when the bill was under consideration, but I think was able to maneuver and jockey successfully so that the CIA might argue today that they don't feel substantially managed or impinged upon by the new head of the intelligence community. So as we sit here um, in 2013 amidst um, a variety of intelligence challenges from Iran to Syria and the crisis that Edward Snowden um, has caused for the National Security Agency, I think it's a good time to ask ourselves and reflect upon the situation, the structure that we set up post 9-11. This was the most tangible reform of the intelligence community and of what the American people thought they were doing when they asked for a reform of intelligence after two calamitous intelligence failures in, the, in President Bush's first term. Um, has the DNI been successful in making the country safer, or did we give the DNI tremendously more uh, of a to-do list, as John McLaughlin likes to say, the former acting director of CIA, did we give the DNI all the responsibility but not enough new authority to make a decisive difference in the overall cohesive management of the American intelligence enterprise, all 17 intelligence agencies that reside around the U.S. government. Um, so with Peter, Peter, with, with that, I will, uh, I'll leave it at that and uh, welcome your questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, that was a great um, overview of the themes of your, of your book. Um, so just, you know, jumping uh, off from where you left it, I mean, is the uh, Director of National Intelligence, the DNI, and I, I, we shouldn't use too many acronyms because we've got a C-SPAN audience, so we should try and, is the Director of National Intelligence basically a, a figurehead w with no authority uh, because he or she uh, doesn't have the budget and is sort of in this coordinating position? Or has the job somewhat evolved so that whether it's uh, General Clapper or some future DNI, Director of National Intelligence, uh, he or she actually can move the community, the intelligence community, in a particular direction. So if surging on an issue like Syria or whatever. I think it's an open question. Yeah. Um, I think that the CIA um, very um, adeptly at the beginning of the Obama administration when Admiral Blair became DNI, he read the statute and it says that the CIA director reports to the DNI, and he tried to make it very, very clear to the Central Intelligence Agency that as far as he was concerned, he ought to be able to appoint um, certain CIA individuals in positions around the world, and that the DNI ought to have a greater oversight role in covert action. Um, these two issues, I think Leon Panetta appealed to the White House and the DNI lost. So. Yeah. And it was a very public and sort of spectacular loss, right? It was Admiral Denny Blair, who was DNI at the time, and he wanted basically the power to appoint station chiefs, effectively the most important person, CIA person in a particular country. He wanted that to be in his remit. He, he did indeed. And um, this is where the book tries to get into some of the vagaries of the statute in that we didn't really consider or debate very much in 2004 the relationship between the CIA and the Director of National Intelligence. However, this came to be one of the chief thorns in the side of the DNI going forward. In the Blair episode, he very publicly appealed and lost. Merit's aside of the issue, 
he, everyone knew that he had fought Leon Panetta on these two issues and had came out, came out on the losing side, and so people in Washington noticed. People noticed that the new director of national intelligence had um, lost an important issue and something that they had appealed to the White House on, and I think it hurt the DNI's authority. So is it going to be, going forward, is this going to be very personality dependent, depending on who the DNI is, because he or she will have to, in a sense, operate by consensus, or, and, and it depends who the CIA director is, or basically is this bureaucratic battle won, which is CIA is going to really kind of generate much of the covert action? And so I think the most optimistic case about whether the DNI can ultimately succeed or not is by looking back at history and the record of the Secretary of Defense. When the Secretary of Defense was created in the 1940s, um, he had no real authority over the departments of Army and the Department of Navy, and over time accreted more authority up until when Congress rev revisited this particular law in 1986. So defenders of the DNI like to say, well look, give it time, we're only in the first few years, the DNI will accrete more authority over time. I think what a lot of the experts also believe in is that if the president makes very clear that the DNI is the head of the intelligence community and of all the things that people want the DNI to do, here are the top two or three things that that will lead to more DNI success because that is, in the end, one of the key ingredients of bureaucratic power in Washington is if people believe that he's acting at the behest of the President of the United States, then he will have more bureaucratic, bureaucratic clout. And so I see that as a way forward, something that may work over time. But I think your point is right, is that we've had real operators, prestigious individuals in the CIA director job, and arguably they've been able to outmaneuver the DNI in, no, in a number of cases. Was the National Counterterrorism Center set part of this 2004? I mean, or was it sort of evolving separately? So it evolved separately. It began with President Bush's idea of a terrorist threat integration center. This, of course, as you remember from the story of 9-11, of how do we fuse information collected abroad with information collected domestically? How do we make sure that we've bridged this foreign domestic divide? Um, President Bush created an entity and the 9-11 Commission did him one better and suggested that he rename it and expand its mission and call it a National Counterterrorism Center. And so it was created in statute by this very same law and right. is at the DNI's office today. And this is an example of an institution which actually I think has accreted, to use your term, sort of power and influence over time, uh, more than perhaps the DNI. I mean, it has become really a coordinating, a successful coordination center for terrorism. I, I think that is um, everyone's view. I mean, yeah. the, the analytical function anyway, the fusion center, the ability to pull together the counterterrorism analyst from FBI, NSA, um, and of course the Central Intelligence Agency to have them all co-located, working in the many cases the same room, and access to all the computer centers um, all the computer terminals around the government, I think has enabled a better exchange of information and a better analytical product for policymakers. And it's a national analog of the Joint Terrorism Task Force is that in every city, right? So that who, who, is, that, who is at the National Counterterrorism Center then? Who, who is, who's part of that? Well, so the, it's the DNI's staff. They very clearly report to the Director of National Intelligence, although they're quite they also report to the White House for some functions for uh, some convoluted reasons I can go into, but largely they report to the Director of National Intelligence, but they are detailed from a variety of other intelligence agencies. So the idea is, is that if you're an FBI counterterrorism analyst and you come to the NCTC, they want you to be able to see the entire perspective of the intelligence community, not just the narrow view from the FBI office but across the government and to work with your colleagues in other intelligence community entities so that you might be able to provide warning and, be, and have a better product so that policymakers can have some idea of the threats arrayed against them. You mentioned the Iraqi uh, weapons of mass destruction you know, sort of intelligence fiasco. Um, and you were uh, on the House Intelligence Committee in the run-up to uh, the hunt for bin Laden 
and it's a matter of public record that you and uh, Mike Rogers were were briefed about that hunt. Um, yes. Very in in January of 2011. So you're one of maybe 20 people in Washington, or a very small group who knew. Uh, to the extent that you can, what uh, what did George Tennant? Uh, so what did uh, what what did um, um, sorry, George Tennant? <laughs> uh, what did the uh, the director uh, director um, uh, Panetta say to you? Well, this is a pretty good story. I mean, this was um, the night that Chairman Rogers had formally assumed the chairmanship of the House Intelligence Committee in January 2011, and I had just been uh, selected as his staff director. And Leon Panetta invited Chairman Rogers out to dinner um, in his private dining room on the seventh floor of the Central Intelligence Agency out at Langley. Um, I, got, I was lucky enough to get to go along as his staffer. And I assumed the dinner was um, a very shrewd way of the CIA director beginning to build a relationship with someone who had oversight responsibility over the agency. Um, and at, so as we walked into the dinner, I expected to go back and have a nice dinner, but we were immediately beckoned into Leon Panetta's office, and he had us sit at his conference table, which was strewn with pictures that we're all now familiar of, of the Abbottabad compound in Pakistan. And a, he had at the table also two of the top spies and analysts on the bin Laden case, and was able to lay out for Chairman Rogers. He pulled a sort of piece of paper out of the breast pocket of his jacket that he looked like he had just briefed perhaps to the White House and had his scribbled notes and gave Chairman Rogers a very detailed update of we think we might have found bin Laden. This is our best lead since Tora Bora. Here are, are the reasons we think that and here are the things we're going to try and do in coming months. And so it was a good first day at the office. Um, I uh, was felt fortunate to be able to get this type of information, but it does say a little bit about the centrality, the continued centrality of the Central Intelligence Agency in some of the biggest intelligence questions facing the government. The reason I mentioned it in the context of the Iraqi WMD um, sort of fiasco is, I mean, you were in the White House when that all played out, uh, not necessarily directly involved in that issue, although you did then later get involved as the senior director for weapons of non-proliferation. Right. You know, the, the case that bin Laden was living in Abdabad um, was a circumstantial case. Mm -hmm. And the case that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction was basically circumstantial. Uh, there wasn't, uh, and, and some of it was, as it turned out, false. So um, I, I guess sort of um, different kinds of questions. One, where you sat at the House Intelligence Committee, um, do, you, do you feel that the intelligence community has a better way of interrogating uh, cases that are circumstantial? Do you think that that uh, better way of interrogating circumstantial cases was used in the bin Laden case? Um, and what are the sort of, how has that been internalized by the, the intelligence community? I, I think so. I think that one of the arguments for a DNI and something that my old boss, Steve Hadley, advanced as one of the reasons he and Condoleezza Rice supported a DNI was that they were colored by their experience in Iraq where they believed that the CIA's information, the CIA's intelligence was considered too heavily, was weighted too heavily against other dissenting views across the intelligence community, of course, namely the Department of Energy's intelligence mm. office. And so I think they saw that the DNI, and others have seen this as a, as a benefit as well, the DNI is able to marshal all the intelligence, all the information from across the community and not just look at CIAs. I think mm. CIA still plays the most prominent role, and they have among them the most brilliant analysts that we have in the country and certainly in the government. Um, but I think that's one benefit of the DNI is that the DNI is able to bring together all the points of view so that we might have a completely balanced assessment on important questions like WMD. Right. So when a national intelligence estimate is written, it, the DNI is now coordinating that? And it yes. The National Intelligence Council is the entity that writes national intelligence estimates. 
previously it had reported to the CIA director. It now reports to the DNI. But, but, but really, right. it's, people would point to me and say, well, you know, the national intelligence process always considered views from across the government. And but it, this is a way of forcing it. And it did. But this meant a way of forcing it. This yeah. gave more rigor to the process, especially as we were sorting through the recommendations of other commissions that looked at the WMD intelligence failure. So I think more analytical and intellectual rigor has been given to the process. Let's just go back uh, before we throw it open to the, you mentioned, you know, obviously it was kind of a common view that the CIA had sort of failed on 9-11. And, and there's um, the very specific issue, which is they, they knew of two people associated with Al-Qaeda who had visas um, who were here in the United States in the months before 9-11. They didn't flag that to the FBI until August of 2001. And there was that very specific intelligence failure. But I think as a broader, I mean, if you look at the 9-11 the Commission, you know, the CIA did a pretty good job of strategic warning that mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda was planning some kind of big attack in the summer of 2001. And you know, all the memos they send and George Tennant had his hair on fire and right. you know, the title of your book is Blinking Red, That's which is right. what he said, the whole system was, quote, yes. yeah, the system was blinking red. So in a sense, you know, was the CIA kind of, there were the people who screwed up about this piece of information, but as an organization, they did a pretty good job of strategic warning about Al Qaeda. And in fact, it seems to me that if you look at the pre 9-11 era, CIA and, and the FBI office in New York um, you know, were really the two institutions that did the most to warn and to be and were concerned about this issue. Um, so I don't know what your assessment is. And well, I think that's a fair point. I look at look yeah. the CIA people that I interviewed to this day are very bitter at the 9/11 Commission's portrayal of their work on the way up to 9/11. They believe that the caricature of the Central Intelligence Agency and the 9-11 failures of just connect the dots is a very superficial explanation of what happened. After all, there was a bin Laden unit at CIA. There was. Is, you know, from early 96, so you know, yeah. that sort of speaks for itself. There was no other place in the US government that really had that kind of level of attention to him. And the, and the book details George Tenet's efforts to have not only the warnings that he gave, at least at a strategic level, to the White House, but he also talked about the considerable efforts that he made in the Counterterrorism Center and the, trying to marshal all the aspects of the intelligence community together to fight the new terrorist threat. So I do think it's fair to say that CIA felt a little bit like a political football um, yeah. in the run-up. Do you think the CIA's mission, you know, the, at the end of the day, CIA's uh, uh, mission is providing strategic warning, warning to the president and his advisors, right? I mean, that's the bottom line, in, in addition to COVID, COVID action. You know, as, you, as is well known, it's sort of devolved more and more into a paramilitary organization that is so focused on CT that do you think the, that, it, that it may have sort of distorted the mission of, of the CIA to some degree? And I'll give you a kind of for instance, um, you know, predicting when the Arab Spring was going to happen we could all make the prediction that these regimes would face opposition. The question is, when would it happen? And I don't think you can fault the CIA for, say, for not knowing which day or month. Right. But I think you can fault them, for instance, in Egypt, you know, when the, when the Salafists, not the Muslim Brotherhood, but the Salafists got 25% of the parliamentary vote. This is the sort of thing that the CIA should, you know, because it has resources on the ground, it should be, and this seemed to be like come as a total surprise. And that's just one example. So the question is, has the CIA moved too far away from what it's supposed to be doing? in an effort to be do, you know, are we, and fighting sort of the last war? Well, I, I think there's something to that, but I mean, I'm more of a defender of what the CIA has done post 9-11. This, yeah. of course, 9-11 is such a shocking, incredibly terrifying event for many Americans, and they doubled, tripled down on their counterterrorism mission and did something they needed to do for the country. It was a threat, the most pressing threat um, I do think now, as we begin to get a better handle, at least on Al-Qaeda's ability to pull off the spectacular styled attack like they did on 9-11, that it's a fair question to ask of, are we devoting enough resources to all the different problems in the world, Egypt, Libya, of course, what's going on in Syria. And I think that's something the Oversight Committees, the President and the DNI 
need to be able to do. After all, that's what we asked the DNI to be able to do, is to take a holistic look of what our people are doing, where the resources are going, and are we postured to be able to face upcoming emerging threats and not just the fights of yesterday. You know, in 2000, 2002, George Tenet tapped uh, Bob Grenier to be the Iraq mission manager, which I think makes a lot of sense. Like, does to have somebody who, so does the DNI today tap, you know, a Syria mission manager? I mean, are the people, because at the end of the day, you have to say you are responsible, uh, you know, uh, General Clapper can't do everything, right? So presumably he would tap somebody to be the mission manager or? He does. And is that? somebody that's within DNI or somewhere else in the ICE, in the intelligence community or? Well, they would be, often they are from another intelligence agency, but in the, when they're serving in a capacity, in a cross community capacity to try and bring together, for example, all the China experts from every different department, they're housed at the director of national intelligence office so that they can try and have some sense of what everyone is doing and make sure it's coordinated. Just to turn to NSA for a second, can you tell us in what your understanding of what, what is, we hear a lot about 215 and 702. Right. What, 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 is, what, is, what does that mean? What are the, and what is the intent of these? Uh, sure. Um, 215 is the shorthand for the section of the Patriot Act that expanded the authority of the government to seek business records, to be able to go to phone companies and say, we would like you to give to us the, what we call metadata, which is a fancy word if you remember looking at your phone bill and it says this number called this particular number. Um, this was born out of 9-11, which was because two of the individual hijackers in San Diego, we didn't know this at the time, that they, we later found out they were in San Diego, but we were monitoring a safe house in Yemen. And had we been able to figure out um, that this particular safe house was calling a residence in San Diego, if we had had access to this database, we might have, now this is not ironclad, but it's just an illustrative example of how the tool could have helped and how 9-11 influenced NSA's collection efforts later, but it could have helped foretell of the existence of other plotters in the United States. But Mike, isn't the counter argument to that the CIA had the information that these two guys were got associated with Al Qaeda, they knew they had visas, in fact they knew that one of them was in the United States. I mean, if yes. they had just called the FBI uh, a year before 9-11 and said, hey, these two people are in the United States. They were living in San Diego under their true names, they right. listed themselves in the phone book. They weren't, you know, it would have been a relatively easy thing to find them. You didn't need the the, the phone surveillance necessary, you just did regular law enforcement. That's right, not necessarily. I mean, yeah. it, with any intelligence or in law enforcement yeah. tool, you want to be able to bring as many tools to bear as possible, and it's very possible if these individuals' names had gotten to the right FBI people, they would have launched a full field investigation, and maybe things would have been different. Yeah. But the point is that why people thought we needed something like 215, and the answer was is that we want to be able to build an analytical case for if there are additional people who would do us harm inside the United States. So NSA sought legal opinions, thought they had sound legal basis for what they were doing. Were you surprised on the closeness of the vote on this issue in the House? I mean, this was almost, uh, this me you know, the, the measure to basically yes. change or end this was very, very close. It was. And, what and we're implying, you know, an unusual amount of Republican and Democratic kind of agreement for, for the House that exists today. No, I think you're right. I think the um, votes for or on and views on national security issues have changed since President Bush was in office and since uh, Tea Party members of Congress have joined the House of Representatives. Um, because? Because it's not just, we're not, 9-11 is not as recent as it once was. People have forgotten some of the lessons and people have a heightened degree of skepticism about the role of the government or increased desire to see privacy and civil liberties protections in place. 
and were offended at the idea that Americans' phone records, even if it didn't have a name or the content of the phone call was in a government database, that was scary and offensive to them. And that's why there was a coalition of um, people on the right and people on the left who almost were able to score a real victory against the Patriot Act 215 provision in July. And your boss, uh, Mike Rogers, of course, is one of the main defenders of this on the Hill. That's right. He and Senator Feinstein have, uh, I think it's fair to say, aggressively defended their oversight of the program and aggressively defended what NSA's role is in this particular matter. And um, tell us then about 702, because this seems less controversial. Americans do That's seem right. to be uncomfortable with having their bulk phone data with the government. Sure. And 702 is the shorthand for, um, and it says this in the statute that refers to the FISA Amendments Act that we debated and passed um, through Congress in 2007 and 8, is the shorthand for our ability to accept, uh, intercept foreigners' phone calls if perhaps they transit through the United States is and, the essence of and what emails. it is. And emails. Phone calls and emails. And so this has been a big issue overseas. I know of a, a, I read the papers of those in Europe and I know the Germans and others are very upset. But you're right, it's been less of an issue in the United States because it's about foreign intelligence collection. There's sort of an analog, the drone issue really became an issue when an American citizen was killed. It, yes. And it did not become a live political issue on the Hill until that point, seems I, to me. I think so. Uh, no, I think you're right. Uh, look, Congress is split on the issue. The intelligence committees, I think it's fair to say, are generally comfortable. They would pass laws to make, you know, codify and strengthen civil liberties protections and increase the transparency, but fundamentally not change the underlying operation of the program in the House and the Senate. Republicans and Democrats and the Judiciary Committees are just in a different place. And so the Congress is split, I think, on these two. Last night, President Obama said to Chris Matthews that um, you know, he's planning to make changes. He didn't specify what they were. And as you know, there's this uh, group at the White House that's working on, on thinking through what those changes might be. Do you have any sense, any predictions about what is likely to happen, what is politically able to fly on the Hill? It, I think this is an open question as to what the review group will recommend and whether President Obama will adopt who, who it. Who is in the review group? The review group is made up of a variety of individuals appointed by President Obama. Um, I think the two most recognizable figures are Michael Morell, who was the deputy CIA director up until very recently. Who now works for you. Who now works at, at the firm I um, am at and working at. And um, Richard Clark who was the counterterrorism advisor for Clinton and for Bush. And they, and along with some others, are charged with reviewing essentially the question of how do we reconcile the tension between security and privacy and civil liberties. And so I don't know what's in their report. I expect mm -hmm. it'll be aggressive. I expect President Obama will speak to it in a matter of weeks. And this will drive the legislative agenda at least on intelligence next year. Great. Well, let's uh, throw it open to your questions. If you have a question, can you wait for the mic and just identify yourself and raise your hand? No questions. This one, this gentleman here. here. You dealt with everything. That's right. <laughs> You're satisfied. Huh? I'll jump in, Mike. Um, Thank you. Hugh Jeffrey, Australian Embassy. Uh, Mike, we've talked about this before. Uh, the connect the dots point that you made is really interesting. And you started off your speech by saying that the agents, the CIA, had all these functions, but in addition to that, it had the function of coordination. But it didn't have the authorities to really make that happen. Um, it seems to me that that coordination function, who, who wants that? I mean, do the intelligence agencies really want a coordinator? Or would they prefer to be left alone? And I get to that question is because, as you outlined, we're still sort of stuck with that situation where there is a coordinator, but it's not really resourced. Uh, you don't really have the authorities to perform that function in an unambiguous way where you have control of people's budgets and you have control of people's institutions. And as a sort of follow-up to that, you know, can you point to sort of, you know, an evolution at the, with the Director of National Intelligence where you think that he, either the President or the previous ones have actually 
there are specific examples where they've really had this role where it's actually more than just sort of window dressing. Right. Um, I, th I think Hugh is onto something. I mean, one of the points of the book is that the Congress didn't spend enough time discussing the relationship between the CIA and the DNI. I think on the one hand, CIA didn't want to be blamed for 9-11 and didn't like the idea that they would perhaps have a new boss. But on the other hand, I don't think that they want it and are probably glad today that they're not vested with coordinating other intelligence entities. I've mm. heard General Hayden say he's not sure how his predecessors were able to do all of the work that was required across these three different mission areas in the Central Intelligence Agency. But by the same token, I don't think the CIA wants to have the DNI trying to get between the CIA and the National Security Council. As you know, the National Security Council and the CIA have a very intimate role in every presidency, virtually. Of course, we're aware of all the uh, famous stories from the Eisenhower and Kennedy years about what the CIA was doing for those presidents, and that's the source of the relationship with the CIA is called the President's Agency, because presidents over time wanted to affect national security policy and realized that they didn't have enough tools to do it, or at least didn't have what they wanted to be able to do in sort of a medium course of action between diplomacy and between military action. I think that's why they rely on covert action to this day as a lever to influence national events. And I don't think the CIA wanted an interloper. I didn't think they, w they don't want the DNI trying to play an oversight role over what their activities are. You know, a uh, couple of, uh, speaking of oversight, do you think, I mean, there have been a variety of discussions about how we could make the drone program more accountable. And some of them, I think, are kind of unworkable. For instance, uh, having a sort of pre-review board, I think there's going to be problems about that because, you know, things move quickly and there's... Right. But what about an after-action review? Because I think it's just natural in, in life. If somebody's grading your homework, you're going to spend more effort, perhaps making sure it's 100% accurate. And also would have uh, an advantage that, you know, the military routinely compensate civilian casualties in drone strikes or other forms of military activity where we kill civilians, as, you know, salacia payments. Um, we don't do that uh, if we inadvertently kill civilians in a CIA drone strike. And so, although, I mean, what, what, I mean, is there anything that we could do that states, you know, wearing your past intelligence committee uh, chief of staff hat uh, that is realistic to make the program you know, we obviously President Obama gave a big speech on May 23rd talking about some changes. Nothing really very substantive seems to have happened, although the number of drone strikes in Pakistan have dropped pretty dramatically. I think that is substantive. But so, of the proposals that are out there, is there anything that actually makes sense? I think this gets to the issue of uh, congressional oversight. I mean, yeah. having worked in the Congress for so many years, the reason these committees were set up is precisely so that there is a check on and an oversight of aggressive intelligence community actions. Um, a lot of people uh, fault the Congress for not doing aggressive enough oversight. I think the Congress could do a better job of explaining what they do. And I think there's definitely room out there for more scholarship on what the appropriate role of oversight is. But um, I think most members of Congress, at least the chairman of the two committees, would say that's our job. It's our mm. job to check the homework of the Central Intelligence Agency. We think we're doing a pretty good job of it, not that there couldn't be more or that there couldn't be mm. some of the reforms that you suggest, but it really gets down to do you want to use the intelligence committees for the purposes they were created for or do you want to create new institutions so that they also will have a check on what the agency is up to? Yeah. Well, I guess the, the argument uh, in favor of maybe having some independent body that was outside uh, would be, you know, the intelligence committees, you know, they're very close to the people that they right. kind of, you know, that you know, and this, it's a relatively small group of people. I mean, you know what the sort of counter argument might be. Uh, but anyway, do you think that there will be any, I mean, one, one of the ideas, of course, was to migrate this all into DOD um, and make it no longer a CIA function. And that doesn't seem to have happened so far because it's, it's complicated to do, it seems the main reason. 
Yeah, uh, judging from the papers, I'm yeah. not sure that it actually has happened. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess if you subscribe to the view uh, that CIA ought to be sticking to collection of intelligence and analysis, then you feel better with the migration of authorities to the Department of Defense. But I don't know how that necessarily leads to increased oversight. I guess the theory is DOD would be able to talk about it more and others would be able to check their work more. Yeah, I think that's part of it. I mean, and also, yeah. you know, it, it is obviously a mil you know, sending a, an armed bomb into somebody's house is a military function. And it, is, it, it, you know, traditionally the CIA, I mean, obviously OSS had a sort of quasi-military function, but um, there's no particular reason why it should be a CIA function. Right um, is, I guess, the idea, and and uh, that you know that there's a whole apparatus at the Department of Defense, Justice, JAGs, who sort of you know are involved in these decisions all the time. That's right. Um, so, so the argument is it would have increased oversight. I think the the DNI does at least play some role in or awareness about these particular programs. The Justice Department does have to opine on their legality, I, and and the White House, I think, does do a lot of work. I know the Bush White House does on uh, trying to oversee these issues. And so there are a lot of layers. I don't think, I, don't, I know this is a big issue. I don't know that Congress is going to particularly get involved in that. I know they're really seized with the uh, national security agencies issues. Well, but we'll see how this develops. I mean, if you the, do the uh, thought experiment where NSA hadn't, those leaks hadn't happened. I right. Mean, I think there was growing kind of uh, movement and I mean it started to have public hearings uh, in fact I testified one before the Senate Judiciary Committee there was one before the Senate Armed Services Committee there was more public discussion because essentially this is the worst kept secret in the world a drone attack is a public event I mean there's there's been a lot of so there would seem to be more movement around discussing it and the president's obviously talked about it but uh, talk to a little uh, Edward Snowden uh, has he performed a useful public service and we're having a discussion in a much more informed way about what the NSA actually does, when you can disagree or agree with what they're doing. But um, well, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, obviously, he broke the law. I, you know, uh, he was a he broke the law. But that's the different question than did he perform a public service in the in when he broke the law? Well, I'm more of the view of uh, you know having written this book and having studied a lot of the commission reports about intelligence failures. You know, it's worth noting that just. As long as ten, as short as ten years ago, the commission reports were beating up the National Security Agency for not keeping up with technological change, not collecting enough information, collecting bad information on Iraq WMD. Indeed, the you know the major commission work uh, that examined the Iraq WMD problem actually faulted NSA for a variety of problems. So I sort of want to make sure that we don't legislate in anger about what the National Security Agency mm -hmm. has done because the reason that they have mounted some of these programs is they were listening to what their polit political leadership said and indeed arguably what much of the country was demanding after September 11th and after Iraq which is that they needed to do a better job of provided wa providing warning to our policymakers so that they might be able to avert a disaster like 9-11. And so um, I want to be careful that we don't just whipsaw the intelligence community one five-year period. You better get a lot better very quickly. And then if you do, we're going to get very mad at you because you were too good at some of the things you were doing. But seeing this group that is, that, that is advising President Obama, who other than Mike Morrell and Richard Clark is on it? Uh, there's uh, Peter Swire, who was a, uh, I believe he was a lawyer out there um, at, in Chicago in the uh, Commission on American Progress, the Committee on American Progress here. Um, and the other two are escaping, although I know, okay. I know who they are. But it sort of are. sounds like a nonpartisan group or expert. I mean, Morrell is a very nonpartisan guy. Uh, Dick Clark, I worked for both Bush and Republican, a uh, Democrat and Republican administrations? I think that people have seen it in different ways. I've seen criticism that they're all insiders yeah. and cronies of the president. I've seen some people say you shouldn't have two people on there that have such intelligence backgrounds. And then I've heard people say, well, there isn't a real strong defender, maybe except for Michael Morell of intelligence community. I think it depends on where you sit is how yeah. you see the commission report. And I think we're going to have to read it to uh, develop a real Do you verdict. think it'll be public? Yes. Great. Yeah, and what do you think it's going to come out? 
Well, I, I think it's going to come out in December, but I'm, the theory, I'm not yeah. down there. I don't yeah. know for sure. I know the government shutdown probably complicated their work, but um, I hear around town that it's coming out soon. The gentleman over here. Can you wait for the microphone for one second? Because uh, that way C-SPAN viewers can hear what you're saying. Uh, Bill Tucker, uh, is our intelligence good enough that you now in our in coordination of it to prevent another 9-11, or, or do we know? Well, I think we have got to look at the record. We have, I think, prevented another major 9-11 style attack, at least. Um, and so I think the intelligence community has undoubtedly, Which, undoubtedly what are you referring gotten to? It better. I'm referring to generally the fact that nothing of that scale has happened. I'm talking about other plots that have been foiled that you speak and write about and know very well. Some have slipped past, like Abdul Matalab, and we got lucky in that we were able to prevent that. But I put that in a different category. Well, Abdul Matalab was the so-called underwear bomber. The underwear Christmas, bomber Christmas of Day 2009. So that's right. total, total, the, the, that actually goes to some of the big themes of your book, which is the DNI and National, Can the National Counterterrorism Center was sort of they were supposed to like make sure that, because there were shards of information in the system, obviously very easy to see post-event, uh, that didn't kind of surface. The dad dropped a dime on his son. Right. There was other, he was on a sort of secondary list, a list for people to go into secondary. If he'd gone to, if he got to Detroit, he would have been gone into secondary for, for additional screening. So that was a kind of example where the apparatus didn't quite work, or maybe that's an unfair critique of the, of, of, of that, of the apparatus, say. Well, so it gets down to what you think, uh, you know, yeah, should it the be mission of intelligence yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, you, yeah. are you gonna be able to prevent every little yeah. event? And I think the answer is no, you're not gonna be able to always operate perfectly. But to the larger thrust of your question, I think the intelligence community is doing a much better job on counterterrorism, and we're, as a result, I think are safer at least from a large-scale attack. Um, the question Peter raises of whether that is because of the institutional reforms that I discuss in my book or just because we were spending up to $80 billion on the mission, doubling what we'd spent before 9-11. So it's debatable whether it was because of the increased money, focus, and lessons learned from 9-11 or whether over time the institutional improvements, as the commission and some would argue, um, that we've made, whether that will lead to increased national security uh, down the road. I think the institutional reforms are an open question and still being debated, but the intelligence community certainly has improved its performance in the last 10 years. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, um, thank you, Mike, very much. Thank Your you, book Peter. is for sale. Great book, Blinking Red, for everybody watching at home. That's right. Um, and uh, you'll be prepared to sign them, I think? Absolutely. Thank okay. you Thank so you very much, much, very much for having me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Enjoyed it.